Right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second part of the uh, our latest Unlocking Innovation, looking into data-driven maintenance. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Carl King. I'm one of the technical and innovation managers here at RIA, and I will be uh, chairing uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, if anyone has... Sorry, I seem to have lost my uh, slides there. Thank you. Just to let everyone know uh, before we get started, we're going to be collecting uh, contact details of organisations with capabilities around uh, data-driven maintenance. So there'll be a, a link in that will be going to that Sam Bemont's going to put in the chat uh, to that you can that will link you to a Microsoft form that you can fill out if you'd like to uh, be considered for this. It's part of the uh, railway technical strategy. So if any of you, if you would like to have your uh, organisation's capabilities added to this. Uh, uh, study for data-driven maintenance and to, so you can be put in touch with other people and with clients, uh, please do just uh, click that link and fill that form out. Just to let everyone know that the presentations will be, uh, we, are being, we are recording this event this afternoon and the uh, recording and the presentations will be made available afterwards. We're going to have uh, five really exciting speakers. To, we're going to have, a, we've got a number of very exciting speakers today uh, covering uh, uh, various areas of uh, data of how we're going to collecting data uh, following on from this morning's sessions. So I hope you enjoy the afternoon. These, as you know, this morning was also about collecting data. We're now continuing that this afternoon. And then tomorrow we'll be looking at how we inter two separate sessions, one on interpreting the data and one on changing uh, your business using that data. So please use the same link as this to join those sessions tomorrow and they'll all will have an informal networking afterwards. So this is the agenda for this afternoon. We're going to be starting and I will, uh, I think we're, we're in, since we've got a very tight schedule, I'll start off straight away if that's okay, everyone. If I can start, so I will close these slides down. And if I could start by introducing uh, Tim, uh, Steve Chambers and Tim Flowers. Uh, and uh, Steve uh, is the Infrastructure um, Monitoring Program Director from Network Rail. Uh, he's an expert in the principles and practicalities of good practice in asset management across rail, airports and infrastructure sectors. His broad experience spans asset management, infrastructure management and operation, rail operations, business planning, culture transformation and change management. Steve is joined by Tim Flower, who is Network Rail's Chief Intelligent Infrastructure Engineer. Tim joined the rail industry in 2001, working on several asset and maintenance data roles before moving on to managing on track on track machines and maintenance performance and in 2009 Tim moved into network operations programs delivering the maintenance effectiveness program including plane line pattern recognition and leading on resolution national maintenance issues. Uh, Tim was appointed as head of maintenance in July 2016 and July 2017 took on chief engineering role for the network rail in intelligent infrastructure program which is what he's going to be presenting on today and I believe you're starting the presentation is that right? Uh, Tim, so if you would like to share your screen and uh, I'll let oh, which you already are, I'll let you begin. So thank you. It's worked. That's Steve, great. Thanks. Not presenting to turn off their cameras, please. And can everyone please uh, make sure you have your uh, uh, microphones muted? And if you have any questions, there will be a question and answer session after every presentation. But if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, for us to for the, put the presenters at the at the end of their presentation. Thank you very much and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Um, so uh, right, okay, here we go. So um, yeah, intelligent infrastructure network. Well, I'm just going to give really a brief overview of the um, the program, um, how we are um, approaching things, and before I hand it over to Steve, he's going to talk in more depth about the infrastructure monitoring program, which I think lots of you would be very interested in. Um, so in terms of intelligent infrastructure network rail, um, it's really about using technology to turn data into intelligent information. Really thinking about what do our teams need. Um, to help them work smarter, be safer, and deliver improved services. Oh, but that's obviously very uh, a bit of a strap line. So what, what is it all about really? It's people and culture transformation. It's helping people to understand why it's important, why, why data is so important to their roles, why it's important that they collect the right data, they give us accurate data, and then we really think about the data that we hold in our systems. Because um, without people, um, and without the culture transformation, the program isn't going to deliver um, the, the, what it what it really clearly can. 
Um, we will we will only be as good as the implementation of our products, and that's right, so important for us to bring people with us. Um, we put five building blocks in when we when we formed the program because we had we we did a lot of thinking around you know what had Orbis done the previous transformation program, what had maintenance effectiveness done, where had they been successful, and and where hadn't they perhaps um, delivered the benefits that we expected, and and through those lessons learned, we came up with these five sort of key pillars. As, um, as to how the programme should deliver. And the first bit, um, and probably for me, the most important bit, I would say that, it is about the engineering assessment. It's about understanding the um, the failure modes of each individual asset, of their components, um, and also the, 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 the impact on the system that those failure modes can have. Because by doing that initial engineering assessment, we're then able to set out what the rest of the programme delivery should look like. So we can use the engineering assessment to think about what we should do to the asset. Should we um, stop buying an asset? Should we um, work with the supplier to change our component in the asset? Because it's never going to give us the um, reliability or performance that we actually need from it. Um, we can also use that to then set the maintenance regime. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment about considering our maintenance regimes. And we're again using that engineering assessment, using failure modes, effect criticality analysis, using reliability centered maintenance to um, deliver an efficient um, maintenance schedule that delivers the performance of the asset um, that is required for where it sits within the network. So again, that's really important. Previously, we had a one size fits all approach to maintenance for the most part, particularly in perhaps signaling and EMP disciplines. Now we're able to put more nuance around where does that asset sit and what is the operational impact of that failure? Um, I think we've had it in track a little bit more over the years with track category, but again, um, we're able to put more depth into that thinking now. And then again, at the back of that engineering assessment, we can then specify um, what, our, what our monitoring requirements are for, for that individual asset or that set of assets. And that could be from a train, which again Steve's going to talk about later. Could be from fixing something to the asset. Could be from a helicopter. Um, um, what it's really about is thinking about the um, what we're trying to achieve, and then setting a monitor piece of monitor equipment to deliver those outputs that we're trying to get to. Sorry, my is, it, is my presentation gone off? It's still visible to me. Okay, I'll keep going. Then it's kind of a bit weird, my end. Um, sorry about that. Um, so uh, yeah, um, once we've got that data, then it really is about what are the analytics we should put in place. So how can we use that data more effectively? What can what can we understand about that data? How can we bring data sets together? Um, how do we predict um, when something's going to go wrong? And how do we diagnose um, the failure modes? And that's that's a very different um, levels of maturity depending on the asset type in question. So in track geometry, we've made huge strides uh, in terms of being able to predict a cyclic top fault or um, when a track geometry twist fault will exceed a threshold. Um, whereas in other areas, we've got lots and lots of work to do, and and this is going to be an ongoing program for, for forever. Not this particular program, but that that that. Um, using the data more and more effectively as we as we understand more about the assets is really key to our future performance. And, and that's again where we need to work closer with the supply chain. At the moment, we try and do everything ourselves. Um, I'm not convinced that that's the right approach. I think there's um, going to be a huge amount of power in working more closely with the supply chain to drive these analytic solutions, um, combining their data and our data to to give really really strong outcomes for the for the network. The next building block was really about planning. So how do we take that data and do something with it um, physically on the network? So what does our um, three to five year, sorry, three to eight year work plan look like? Um, so we've got an asset lifecycle planning piece. And then what once it's entered into the sort of maintenance um, timescales around two years out for some of the bigger works, how do we take that through to the day of the race so that people have got really effective tools that bring together the access, the um, the available resources, the available machinery, the available materials, so on and so forth. So we build a really, really strong plan. And then the final piece about execution, what do we give the guys when they're going out there? What information can they have at their fingertips to make their roles easier and more effective? And what do we want them to capture for us, which again then feeds back into our analytics stack, driving better analytics, which means again, we've got better informed people when they're going out to work. And, 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 and underpinning it all, it's about that continual feedback. Um, 
COVID's obviously made us reconsider what we're delivering, making sure that we're delivering the right things for um, the end customer, the passenger, the freight operators, but all uh, and that gets specified through our route and region um, teams. So they're making sure all the time that we're delivering what it is they they expect. In terms of where we are today, remote condition monitoring coverage, we've done it. We've done a really fantastic job over the last 10 years, fitting our particularly our signaling assets, also our power supplies, our points heating, um, lots and lots of track circuits out there, lots of points fitted, rail and equipment room temperature. So we've made a lot of progress, but I guess our eyes are really wide to um, the opportunities that IoT bring, the new sensors that are coming, being introduced to us all the time. Um, just presents so much opportunity from remote condition monitoring coverage. Um, but we, we, where we haven't been so successful is getting all that into a single central system. We need to get much better at data integration to get the full value. We need to get everything into a single place so that the um, end users have what they need at their fingertips. They haven't got to search through multiple systems. And we need to be better with the supply chain as well, helping them understand what it is we're looking for. So um, giving our requirements out, pub just publishing them on our on our um, external website. We've put a lot of effort into switching, crossing, monitoring, both from a train born and a fixed perspective. We need to get that out there so that the supply chain can understand what it is we're trying to deliver and can develop solutions accordingly. And we also need to make it easy to, to, to buy things from a route perspective and obviously for the supply chain to sell things to us. Um, the final bit to talk about is what does it mean for the front line? It's about simple to use tools that meet their needs, automating manual tasks. That's a big effort for us at the moment, using remote condition monitoring to understand asset state, but then taking it on and predicting time to failure and root cause, giving people data when and where it's needed so that they are able to really do a good job when they go out there. Um, making people safer as well, better planning means less, less time on the asset really, really fundamental. So it's about doing the right place in the right work. Sorry, right work in the right place at the right time. And uh, I'll hand over to Steve now. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I will just share. Of course, that's coming up. Thanks, Tim. So uh, hopefully the slides are now up. You can see that. Um, I assume that's a yes. Uh, so, so what I want to do is um, working very closely with the uh, as, as part of the intelligent infrastructure remit in Network Rail. Um, we've set up a program which I'm leading uh, on uh, infrastructure monitoring, particularly looking at trainborne infrastructure monitoring. And the program was established a year ago um, to specifically um, sort of respond to several things coming together. Um, one which um, picks up on what Tim mentioned, all about the end users. There's a real drive, I think, stronger than I've ever seen it in 25, 30 years in the industry to really grasp the sort of nettle and, and separate trains from people now. Uh, we still got too many people, too many maintenance and engineering teams spending too much time out on the lines uh, inspecting uh, it's inspecting the assets. Apologies, it's telling me the uh, contents not displaying. Exactly. It works fine at our end. It's still there, is it? Okay. Apologies, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, fit off my um, so, so spending far too much time on the ballast, um, and, and there's a real drive to, um, to to sort of grasp the opportunity now and uh, move to more automated inspection and reduce the time that uh, teams have spent out there inspecting the assets. Um, at the same time, the last sort of five years or so, particularly, uh, we've seen huge leaps forward in terms of particularly the ability to handle large volumes of data, the sorts of ranges of uh, monitoring that Tim was running through just then. Um, it opens up new possibilities for how we uh, handle data, how we collect data um, and ultimately get the sort of insights which the frontline teams that have got more than enough on their plate already. How do we just give them the insights that they need? Uh, to be able to do their uh, do their roles better um, and smarter. Thirdly, uh, we, we've seen with devolution a uh, big shift from sort of a one size fits all approach of network rail in the past to we've now got 14 different routes, uh, all of whom have different sort of levels of ambition um, and aspirations in terms of how they use data and how quickly they develop uh, to move from that sort of one size fits all approach to uh, the risk based maintenance regimes and take the opportunities that are presented uh, from some of these uh, uh, progresses in the sort of data science market in particular. Uh, 
And, and the fleet that we've got, so within the uh, network rail services, we've got a fleet of yellow infrastructure monitoring trains, which are becoming a uh, little bit sort of life expired. And some of the equipment and monitoring equipment is obsolete. Um, and as I say, we're missing out on some of those opportunities to move that forward. So we're looking at how do we really challenge, develop that future strategy and vision for how we uh, transform the way we collect, analyze and share our infrastructure monitoring information. We think there's big potential to move beyond the uh, dedicated yellow fleet and actually make use of much of the equipment that's out on the um, out on the service trains too. Apologies, I've lost my slides again. Um, I will just try and move that forward. I think I'm having the trouble you had to. Let me just call that back up. So our approach um, in the programme is on two key themes. Um, the first is all around how we do more with what we've got. We're an agile programme. We want to really learn by doing. Um, and what we've established is alongside the existing monitoring fleet, there's a lot of capability and a lot of potential um, out on existing service fleets um, to get more insight into the behaviour of our infrastructure and the rolling stock that operates on it. Examples uh, are a lot of the new service trains coming into use have geometry measurement systems fitted on that enable us to continually monitoring the uh, monitor the geometry of the uh, the track. Equally, we've got equipment fitted to a lot of service trains that allow us to continually monitor the overhead line condition. So there's big opportunity to really grab hold of the opportunities, grab hold of that data and information um, and use that uh, in an iterative way to start delivering and making a difference for the real end users uh, who are reliant on this data in their day to day maintenance and engineering jobs. The second path is all around the future of trainborne monitoring and how do we um, shape the future strategy and, and make use of um, the capability that's in the market and the sort of new players and new possibilities there, but also get a really deep understanding of our customer requirements. So we're spending a lot of time talking with all the routes um, and regions in Network Rail to really get underneath what are their real needs for those end users, but also what are the capabilities in the market and how do we as Network Rail um, engage better and more effectively um, to, to, to sort of bring some of that to life for the future strategy. And a little bit more about our thought process, what we're seeking to do through the programme in the conversations, we uh, issued a prior indicative notice to the market a couple of months ago, um, which encouraged the, uh, the the rail industry and the, the, the suppliers out there to come and engage with us and think differently and help us shape how we do infrastructure monitoring and how we improve the service against those goals I set out earlier in the future. We're looking for uh, new inventive ideas, innovations and possibilities, not just in terms of the technological capability, uh, but in the way in which we contract and work together. Uh, I think that there's huge opportunity to uh, really collaborate a lot more strongly as an industry and with the uh, sort of advent of uh, GBR, I think we'll see that strengthening a lot and Network Rail really want to make a step change in the way in which we collaborate with the market and Tim touched on it, uh, with this sort of data and analytics, data science uh, uh, sector. There's this sort of um, challenge around how we embrace the market capability. What do we want to do in house? What do we want to seize from the market? And how do we develop that together and create an environment where um, where we're able to keep up to date, I think, with what is now a very fast moving environment. And we've moved away from the sort of capital supply model where perhaps we buy some monitoring equipment that may last 10 to 15 years to a much more dynamic market and much more dynamic sort of capability around data science where every two or three years, perhaps there's different players, different science data, uh, different technology that will be in the lead. So we've got to create an environment where we can buy into that and provide and take benefit from those solutions, but meet the resilience that a national railway network needs uh, from some of those sort of uh, innovative technologies. So we're looking for ideas, not just say on the technology, but also how we do that and how we integrate closer and collaborate better between uh, ourselves and the industry. Uh, Finally, the um, sort of piece I'd probably end on here um, before going to some thorny issues is really it's all around the end users. The, the program we've set up picks on Tim's final slide as well. It's really all about how do we enable the, uh, the, the teams with the real jobs there, the maintainers, the asset engineers, the operators. How do we really make their jobs safer and easier um, by providing that information that they need at the right time of the right quality? not drowning them in data, but giving them that real sort of uh, uh, nuggets and insights of information that allow them to uh, do their jobs better. 
Finally, I'll just end on some of the thorny issues that um, sort of face us in delivering this program. Uh, we've already made a lot of progress in terms of learning by doing and um, harnessing some of that new uh, your existing information on our service trains. Um, but I think some of the sort of challenges we see will come up is how do we generate the um, confidence ultimately in our supply chain um, and, and amongst new suppliers and existing suppliers that we're willing to do things differently. I'll be honest, uh, I think we've had a few goes of this in the past and that's left its sort of mark sometimes. Uh, but there is a real uh, intent and a real drive to do things differently and we need to bring our supply base, uh, both new and existing suppliers with us on this and, and sort of get that trust and confidence that we are ready to listen and do things differently where that adds uh, where that adds significant benefit. Uh, there's a sort of willingness to adopt different commercial models for data and insight provision, not just for ourselves, but also within the market and the marketplace and the suppliers. How we all collaborate and work together more effectively, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, but we need to think differently about perhaps how we can do that to um, to meet the sort of demands and the, the changes in the environment that are sort of outlined. Um, and, and sort of how do, how do we get that balance between resilience and um, innovation? to really sort of unlock that innovation and say, well, how do we bring that to bear, but provide that in a solid, confident, resilient way that uh, allows the railway to depend on that? And more importantly, the people who are delivering on the front line, how can they really depend on that? Uh, so I'll wrap up there. Apologies for the slide uh, confusion. Hopefully uh, they, they followed through with what I was saying and I'll uh, stop presenting there. No problem. Thank you, Steve and uh, Tim, if you want to come on. Thank you both very much for very insightful, interesting uh, presentations. We've got a number of questions that have been popping up in the chat. Uh, uh, Liam Crozier, you've uh, asked the question. Uh, I don't know if you want to, Liam, if you'd like to put your uh, camera on your voice, if you want to ask your question uh, to Tim and Steve directly, or if you'd rather I re read it, whichever you prefer. I think I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it. Uh, is there plans to scope or, or scope to create uh, application uh, interfaces? Uh, to uh, access the data for analytics machines, for analytics, machine learning or other projects and systems? And has there also been thought on making some parts of the data openly available? I think this was mainly asked to, aimed at you, Tim, this one. Yeah, yeah, and I think Sam's follow on question is very, very closely linked as well. So I'll pick up both if that's all right. So Sam asked around what IR data we made available through the marketplace. Um, I guess in both cases, we haven't we haven't got there yet. Um, I think uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we really want to make that happen. I think I alluded to it a bit. Um, I, I do see a world where the suppliers do um, are able to sort of take our data, build on it, maybe merge it with their own systems, and and then sell it back, sell it, sell it in, I guess, insight back to us into our insight tool. Um, so I think that is that is the direction of travel. Um, I think the APIs will be linked to the rail data marketplace, so it'll all be part of that single single data marketplace. But what what hasn't yet been decided is what data goes in there. So I think each uh, how it all fits together, what it all looks like, that's being worked through at the moment. And um, we've done some test cases. Um, we're happy to share data so people can learn um, via NDA and whatever. But in terms of APIs, that's probably a little bit further down the road. But definitely something we see coming in the future. All right. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Steve, do you have anything you want to add to that or? No. OK, thank you. That's brilliant. Uh, moving on, uh, I'll come back to Sam's question in a minute, but uh, Graham Sutherland asks, what volume of data do you expect to collect from the range of devices on the railway you have currently? And how will this grow in the future? <laughs> that, you, that very, I'll, uh, I'll say it for a very interesting, loaded question, that one, Graham, but uh, I'll let Steve and Tim see if they have any views on that. But uh, 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 loads. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm just saying, very large. So, so <laughs> a, a PLPR, a PLPR run picks up five terabytes of data, yeah, and we send it. We do at least four of those a day, so that gives you an idea of the volume that we probably won't be sharing through APIs because it costs a fortune. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, that that is an idea of the scale. So we process all that at the moment on our own server, just because it, it is so big. Um, and there is there is manual handling of that data to a degree, so we take it off the disk and stuck it into a take it off the train manually. So um, it is it is it is big, but most of the sort of points data, for example, track circuit data, that's sent through GPRS. So it is it's pretty low volume. I guess it's about 
specifying what data you need back at source and what can be processed at the edge, how often you send it off, because all those things end up resulting in battery life, don't they? Yeah. So um, it's a non-answer, but... Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness to Graham's question, I think probably what he was also getting at is, that, do you see, I mean, obviously you're collecting a lot of data at the moment, but do you see that expanding and uh, significantly and with more with greater monitoring and so forth? Or do you think it'll you'll be continuous to gather the same amount as you are at the moment? Do you want to go, Steve? You've probably got a view yeah, on that Yeah, no, I, I think it'll expand. It'll expand significantly. I think we'll go from the sort of one size fits all is infrequent measurement using the dedicated yellow fleet. I think we'll see a huge increase in the use of service trains for uh, gathering data. Uh, so I think we'll see an exponential increase in the data that we're capturing. And I think that shifts the focus then, as, as Tim hinted there or mentioned there, to edge processing and, and how can we shrink the volumes of data that ultimately we're then shifting around the system. And I think although we might collect that, actually the ability to pick out the nuggets, if I can call it that, and just take what we need from that, uh, will become more important as we then shift that uh, shift that data to the end users. Uh, but but uh, I think that will that will definitely shift as we we rely more on service monitoring. Yeah, um, from, from my perspective, just just quickly add, um, I think like I said, we need to do better at specifying what we're looking for, but also understanding what the supply chain is offering. So those two things coming together should be really really powerful. Um, sometimes, obviously, the supply chain will think of ideas that we haven't. So we really are keen and we will see a proliferation of devices over the next five years, without a doubt. OK, Graham, does that, yeah, in, in all seriousness, Graham, does that answer your question or was there something we've missed off that? Yeah, that. yeah I think that's that's a really great answer, actually. I really appreciate the uh, the, the detail that you gave there. And I, I think what you said, actually, Tim, was very true because there's like um, the goals that we t we need to go for and how they are defined and, and how they're specified that's going to be very important so we get the most out of it so like you say there's a great range of you know the, the yellow train will uh, the, the new measurement train will generate masses of data and less less data in uh, certain other types so i think it depends on the kind of question you need to ask uh, what's relevant and what's the best way of getting the most out of it so i think it's a very very good uh, answer actually and i think that the, the the thing is for me the takeaway is the is the is the range of uh, data the possibility of of masses from one end of the spectrum to uh, you know much smaller amounts from different types of uh, sensors and, and devices so yeah it does it does actually uh, uh, explain a lot thanks thank you Graham. Uh, thank you very much guys uh, I, I know we need to move on but I'll just uh, quickly ask the the question that uh, um, that Javi Cruz has put in which is what's going do we know what's going to happen to uh, current systems and legacy systems such as Centrix, are they going to be integrated or run in parallel or do we know? Or is that, that we're, work, we're working through it at the moment, Carl. It's, it's, um, we, we basically need to have a single user interface for our end user, otherwise things are going to get missed. There's moving to more safety critical monitoring. You, we run the risk of somebody missing an alarm because they're looking at a different system. So the goal is to have everything in one place from a, from a human factors perspective. We haven't yet sorted out the architecture of that yet. OK, thank you very much. And hopefully we can like feed that back in a, in a future event. Then that's brilliant. Uh, I'll move on. I'll have to move on quickly now. But Steve and Tim, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you very much. Uh, if I can ask everyone to give Steve and Tim a virtual round of applause using the, uh, uh, the zippers on our. Uh, the on the uh, on teams, thanks very much, everyone. That's brilliant using the uh, the, the old hand emojis. Uh, if I can now introduce uh, moving on to, to Stephanie Klecker and Neil Fleming, uh, who are both from Porterbrook Leasing. Uh, Stephanie is the Head of Digital Services. Hello, Stephanie. And uh, Neil is the Digital Services Program Manager. They're going to be presenting on the use of rolling stock data for targeted adhesion management. Uh, Stephanie joined Porterbrook in 2019 to develop and deliver Porterbrook's digital strategy. Uh, she's worked in aerospace and rail with a background in materials and metallurgy. It's a, in metallurgy, sorry. <laughs> I knew, I was gonna, I knew I was gonna trip up on something eventually, and a specialism in remote condition monitoring systems. Uh, she moved from Siemens Mobility with over 10 years experience in tackling the challenges of deploying remote condition monitoring solutions within rail. And Neil joined Porterbrook in 2020 and is responsible for the delivery of all projects within the digital services program. Uh, he's worked in the rail for nearly 10 years in both the UK and Australia. And originally from a design engineering background, uh, he started his career with Wabtec Rail before moving to SNC Lavalin and finally Porterbrook with experience in the delivery of a variety of rail and transport projects. So Stephanie, Neil, really pleasure to have you both here today. Thank you. Stephanie, I understand you're starting, is that correct? And uh, I am. 
And, and Neil's got the wonderful job of sharing the slides, so go oh, for it. <laughs> well, I will hand over to you and thank you very much. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it actually ties in really nicely with the presentation just by Steve and Tim, because really what we're going to show here is actually a, a pilot kind of project where we've actually um, trialled some of those principles and methods that they were just discussing on, on, at a strategic level. So um, what we've done in this project is actually try and use some on-trained data for targeted adhesion management. And I should probably set the scene. Porterbrook owns nearly a third of all the passenger rolling stock in the UK. And really, my part of my digital strategy is trying to really harness the data we can get off those trains, not just for the use of train operators, but also for the use of network rail and other areas of the industry. So this is a real showcase place to kind of see how we can actually do that. So Neil, if you want to go on to the next slide, that'd be fantastic. So in this quick session, what we're going to first of all do is just give you a bit of an idea of the mission and the project overview, um, and I'll kind of show you the time frame and how it's evolved. Neil's going to go into the project execution and outputs and show you what the project actually delivered, and then kind of touch on some of the challenges and successes that we had as we moved through the project. And then I'll finish by talking about the commercial rollout and fleet expansion opportunities, because actually part of the innovation here is the commercial approach as much as the technology approach. Um, so Neil, if you do the next slide, perfect. Um, so I think the first thing I should state is this is a collaboration project and you've got the four project partners there at the top right of the slide. GTR, our train operator in this case, Network Rail, Route Reports, who are an SME within the supply chain and Porterbrook. Um, and the idea was, could the four of us get together and actually help Network Rail with targeted adhesion management? And that, uh, that adhesion management would be targeted on areas of track that's showing poor adhesion and significant lost time. And it's quite important the connection of those two, because we have done projects previously looking at just poor adhesion, and you end up with kind of a smattering everywhere, and it becomes actually more data than Network Rail can cope with. So the idea here was, can we use the impact on the timetable to focus the deployment of adhesion management to help Network Rail prioritise scarce resource? How are we going to do that? Um, well, in this case, we were looking to use a GPS feed and an OTR, OTDR feed from our fleets on the Sussex routes. And the idea was, can we map, can we trend that, and can we actually turn that into something that the adhesion controllers buy into? As we move through the project, and Neil's going to touch on this in his pitch in a minute, um, we actually realised there was another opportunity where on this route, Network Rail were instrumenting their adhesion management machines, the water jetters, with tracking devices. So we actually had the opportunity to here to actually look at where jetting had occurred and see whether or not it actually made a difference to the adhesion performance and lost time on those sections. Um, another critical element of this project was that people piece that Tim touched on. And actually, if we were to go away and develop a model and data and visualizations that were no good to the end user, then the whole project would become redundant. So right from the very start, we've had the adhesion controllers actually design the sort of front end that came out of this project with us. And then the final stage of this was, can we look at a way to include non Porterbrook fleets? So the objective here was not to try and block the market. It wasn't that we only wanted something to offer to Network Rail, which was only possible on Porterbrook fleets. It was about building the supply chain so that Porterbrook's data was valuable, but it was scalable nationwide to fleets other than Porterbrook's, as well as Porterbrook's other fleets. Um, Neil, if you move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so what we've got on this slide is really just giving you a bit of a gist of the project life cycle. Um, so the project actually has spanned the last couple of years and there are four key strands that I just wanted to quickly touch on before we move into the project details. The maturity is quite a critical one. So we started this in early 2019 um, where we were really working in a collaboration trial environment between ourselves, Network Rail and Porterbrook. And it's taken us kind of 18 months to get to a point where we actually feel we've got something ready that's productionizable and ready to commercialize. So that's a fairly significant investment time um, and it's something to bear in mind when you're considering stress and strain on the supply chain to have to work on something for such a long period. But actually you need to go through a couple of cycles of autumn to explore some of the principles here. So it was a kind of natural um, evolution of time. The next thing is progress. So um, in 2019, we had the engagement with Network Rail. We we're identifying the problem statement and trialling through the first autumn of 2019 to early 2020 of analytics we thought would work. 
And um, what we realized was it was close, but it wasn't quite right. And one of the main things that wasn't quite right about it is the data we had, and you can kind of see that in the next stream there, was event-based remote condition monitoring and OTDR data. And those two data feeds alone weren't enough to pinpoint exactly where the wheel slip or low adhesion hotspots were actually being seen. So we were able to tell Network Rail a GPS position where these things were, were occurring. But if you go to somewhere like Clapham Junction, that's a bit of a disaster because you've got so many adjacent lines. So what we then went on to do is actually develop that analytics further um, so that in the, the autumn for 2020 and 2021, we were able to pinpoint exactly where the adhesion issues were occurring down to a running line level. The other thing I wanted to highlight on this slide is the delivery partners. Um, there was no intention that Portabrook would do this on our own. And actually part of our role in the industry is to try and support and grow the supply chain. So after the initial engagement in 2019, we partnered with a company who we felt had really good capability and also had a good relationship with GTR and Network Rail. And that's, that's Root Reports. And you'll see that we've had this engagement with them since that point until now. Um, we're still very much aligned. And when I kind of finish the, the presentation at the end, I'll touch on how we're kind of parting company, but in a way that really we're still in partnership, but we want to expose this whole um, principle to people that are, are Portabrook's competitors. And we can only do that if we're actually not part of the end product. Um, so there's actually quite a strategic reason that we've, we've separated there. I think the other final thing I should probably touch on is on the data feeds. Um, in order to resolve the, the issues that we had in the 2019 trial, we actually brought on an additional GPS feed mid-2020. Um, and I think the landscape here shows you how many data sets need to come together in order to actually deliver a product that's useful. Um, and there was a significant amount of data engineering that's actually gone into this project to make that possible. So Neil, I guess over to you to go through the project execution and kind of some of the challenges and successes we've had. Fantastic. Thanks, Steph. So, yeah, so as Steph mentioned, we had some early engagement in 2019 with um, key stakeholders with Network Rail, really to exhibit the requirements and understand what, what our end problem we were looking to solve. And as Steph mentioned, that, that granularity of the project was really a key focus of what the development really into 2020 needed to be. So the core scope of this project then was the development of, a, of, of the front end platform and the back end um, data engineering and data analytics required to give a V1 really release uh, during 2021. Uh, Steph touched on it before in the previous slide, um, but the opportunity then as part of uh, aligning with our, our key data partner, um, Root Reports, they had a parallel project um, was looking at fitting and um, was fitting GPS uh, equipment to the network rail treatment trains. And, and really that opportunity allowed us to, uh, to answer some two key questions really. Uh, the first being, how do we identify problematic adhesion areas on the network and that's really the core scope of the adhesion and lost time in section of the project and then the opportunity part of the project that was realized well how can we monitor those treatment fleets on the network um, and that was really the, the parallel project that root reports were, were providing um, and the end output really is uh, on the benefit realized for the end user is this unified seasonal intelligence platform um, that we uh, we've created a proof of concept at the end of march this year and we're looking at further developing and trialing as part of autumn this year um, so this visu visual uh, video is a, as a it's kind of visualization of the basic concept of the tool. Um, uh, I hope you all can see it. Do let me know if there's any problems with it too. But the video shows uh, in a minute, you'll see the green is the train traveling on a specific section of track uh, and you'll see it will come across a, a, an area of, of potential lost time, um, which will flash red. Um, so the premise being that when this red lost time in section area is then mapped across multiple adhesion events from the on-train data recording data from the vehicle, the platform can identify likely areas of lost time um, and visualize these for the users uh, to use uh, as part of their normal seasonal performance responsibilities. Um, our, our development team and our project team endearingly call this the hungry caterpillar as the green caterpillar progresses along the track and, and eats its way through red adhesion areas. Um, this key focus here is showing that we have those key adhesion hotspots flashing red on individual sections of track uh, and lines and that uh, that was key because that was a key development from um, the early engagement in 2019. And so the actual output of the tool then is 
uh, is uh, shown as a visual on the screen here. So this is just a snapshot of it. Obviously, go, there's an awful lot more um, back end processing that's not really shown on the screen here. But what we've ended up with is a, a user user friendly front end dashboard um, that feeds in all of the calculated adhesion treatment uh, uh, and lost time data into the platform live um, through, uh, as Steph mentioned, an awful lot of back end data processing. Uh, the tool then can provide a train position map to the exact track up and down and correct within 10 meters. So that was a key, a, a key objective from um, the development from 2019. Um, Users now are able to log into the platform and directly view and compare treatment data with the adhesion data, adhesion data with lost time data, and they can gain an immediate overview of where problems on the network are and um, which require further treatment. Uh, key development for this year also from the proof of con concept is that they can also compare data across multiple days and weeks so they can investigate looking at um, identify patterns in adhesion loss so that that opens up the user user not only from a controller point of view people directing the treatment trains but also to the seasonal performance project managers to look at trends across season and season um, also you'll see on the screen the individual adhesion dots color-coded red um, and various um, and red and orange um, users can click on those specific areas of adhesion and, and get a breakdown of further information including uh, ELR mileage uh, asset ID uh, track codes uh, line of route so um, it's not just a, a, a kind of a front end fancy good looking um, visualization tool there's a lot of, uh, of data that can be interrogated for indicative purposes as well so um, really good position to get in for this autumn some other challenges and successes. Well, successes, uh, as I mentioned, the combined platform with uh, a user friendly interface. Um, from the proof of concept, um, we were able to, uh, uh, well, the tool from the, the data processing at the end of the, of the season um, was able to um, kind of predict around when the leaf fall start date was. So the data in the, from the tool from the proof of concept showed a correlation. Um, we, through engagement with Network Rail, were able to identify known days of adhesion problems. Um, the tool itself identified some spikes in the data consistent with the feedback that we were getting from um, the key stakeholders and user user and users. Um, and similarly, the, the tool identified areas where adhesion controllers expected there to be issues. We saw uh, key spikes across the data, so that, that gave us confidence in um, the next stage requirements and the development of the tool for this autumn. Some of the challenges, um, data availability, um, upload frequency of WSP data is, is key, um, and, and that's over often Wi-Fi when vehicles return to depot. Um, the data processing, um, uh, as Steph mentioned before, uh, is actually probably the biggest challenge. We've got multiple data sources um, all combining in to show um, what is a very effective and user friendly and simple looking interface, um, but by no means is a simple process behind the scenes to do that. And then also Steph mentioned before, and I think you're going to touch on that now, Steph, the, the, the commercial approach and, and, and the innovation behind that um, is, is quite an, an interesting and, uh, and, uh, and challenge that, we, that we're addressing at the moment. So I'll hand back to you, Steph, to talk more in detail on that. Yeah, thank you. it's the last slide because I know we're kind of a bit short on time. But um, so the idea here was how are we going to commercialise this? How you know how do the people who've been involved in developing this actually kind of cover their opex and actually get incentivised to kind of have this approach moving forwards? Um, so we've got a bit of a, a flow chart on here, but um, essentially what we're offering this year is we're trying to split this out such that Porterbrook offers a curated data subscription which is basically the right data from our fleets that's compatible with the tool um, but we're pushing that across into ideally network rail some kind of data marketplace and I think actually the DFT announcement at the end of last week is, come, is really timely because having a location such as that to push this data which is essentially raw data but curated raw data um, Route reports are then offering Network Rail a visualisation licence. So the idea is they suck in data that any data that, that, that meets that format and they can visualise it in the tool that we've just shown. So this way, Porterbrook's able to cover their OPEX of actually providing that data, um, but equally other competitors or people unrelated to Porterbrook are able to offer the same curated data in that, in, in that format, which could also be wrapped into this route reports tool. 
Um, so it, it was actually, it looks quite simple on the screen, but it's been quite complicated to come up with a commercial approach that we think actually works as a scalable kind of industry-wide solution that's open to all. The other thing that's quite important is this passing of the curated data into a central place. And I think it, it kind of um, links into them, some of the questions we had at the end of Steve and Tim's conversation, because Having that data in Network Rail's data marketplace actually would enable them to open it up to other suppliers and other end users. It's not that Network Rail are being offered just one tool and they've got one use case that's being capitalised from, from the data. So that model there is actually quite strategic in, in that respect because it opens data up as well as offers Network Rail a tool that we've worked hard on to kind of tailor to their end needs. So I know we're out of time, aren't we? But I just that was really wanted to talk about actually that commercial rollout, commercial approach is actually just as complicated sometimes as the data engineering, the technical challenges. Yeah. Of course, say as an engineer, Stephanie, in my my experience in my home, the, the commercial is usually more complicated than the technical. But uh, that might just be how useless I am with money. I don't know. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, Stephanie and uh, uh, Neil. I don't know if you'd like to turn your camera on. Thank you both for absolutely excellent presentation. I'm going to try and bash through. You've got quite a lot of interesting questions, so let me see if I can get through a few of them. Uh, Tim Flower, if I could start with one from Tim Flower, who was saying, were there any contractual issues to overcome uh, in terms of providing the wheel slip data? Uh, I don't know, I know that's quite a specific uh, commercial question. Is there anything you can say about that, Stephanie? Or is that yeah, so at this stage, no, because, and, and that was deliberately why it's a collaboration project. Um, the commercial offers just come out from us to um, Network Rail. So I think if it's him, if there are going to be any, it's going to happen now. So it, let's see. But at the moment, everyone's been very collaborative on this. Brilliant. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the next one from Ian, uh, no, sorry, from Graham Sutherland. Uh, he was saying how great it looks. Uh, I think this is more named at you, Neil. Uh, how, ac how accurate is it and what are the metrics used to judge effectiveness in the tool? Yeah, so uh, I'm struggling a little bit with my camera. I have tried to turn it on, so apologies. But um, yeah, so as we mentioned, that the, the key the key accuracy that we we wanted to reduce down to was the the the, the lost time in section. So that's a 10 meter sectional accuracy. Um, and I guess Steph, is there any other any other key metrics that we we want to look at from an accuracy point of view? Yeah, I think one of the things that would be really good for us to do would be to validate whether or not that there is poor adhesion. And I think actually that was one of the challenges is that currently poor adhesion is is mainly tracked through driver reporting it through. I think it's basically a form they submit. So you haven't actually got a quantitative data set through the comparison. Um, so we're looking at trending and whether or not the data has correlated with, with what the drivers are reporting, which it is. Um, but I think on a, you know, from a scientific perspective, there's probably further um, like confirmation that we can probably get over the coming years to make sure that that it is truly accurate data. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one from Ian Maxwell. He says it looks like your system is focused on adhesion problems affecting traction. Uh, is it able to also look at adhesion affecting braking? Yeah, and we've had that question quite a lot, and that's definitely something that's being rolled into the platform at the moment because we we do have data available to look at wheel slide and in uh, poor adhesion under braking. So yes, equally, you know, other expansion to can can you correlate this with vegetation type, etc. Yes, all of that is something that I think route reports definitely would be look to, looking to incorporate or even work with someone like the Met Office. Then. Oh, thank you, that's excellent. Uh, I'll come back to Sam's question in a minute, but uh, if I could ask uh, Matthew. Matthew Burroughs question. What do you think the level of efficiencies are that could be achieved with adhesion management if this data was readily available? Oh, do you know, I don't know. And I think actually it would probably be for Network Rail to comment on that because um, mm. I, I think at the moment the deployment is very much reactive and also not based on quantitative data. And I think until you have you know, a stake in the ground at using quantitative data and compare what it was like before and after, you can't, I wouldn't be able to give an estimate, I don't think, Carl, at, that, at this point, but perhaps next year when we've run a second autumn. Unless, Neil, have you, have, we, have you got any extra info on that? Sorry, I did just drop out there, but no, are we talk, just, just give me an overview of what we were just talking about then. Have we done anything looking at the efficiencies that we've actually um, saved for Network Rail? No, it's actually one of the key objectives for this year's autumn trial. It's one of the things that we're the most excited about, actually. So we got some indicative um, outputs from the proof of concept, but actually that's what we're most in, we're most excited about from doing the trial over the next autumn period is, is really valid. Brilliant. Thank you both. Well, I'll call it a day there at the moment. And there is another, uh, Sam's got a question for you, but I think he'll pick, pick that up with you later, or you can maybe pick it up in the chat. Uh, which is a good point. And uh, but if I can ask everyone to give Stephanie and Neil a very big round of applause, I think we all agree that was a 
excellent and very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for that. Uh, hopefully if you're around at the networking at the end, if you, I'm sure there'll be a few more people who want to talk to you about this and I'm sure you're going to get some uh, quite interest in the data. So thank you both very much for spending the time coming today to present that to us. It's been yeah, thanks thanks very much. Both. Thank you both. Um, thank you. Uh, moving on, if I could ask Liam Bradley Smith to turn his camera on. Liam, are you there? Afternoon, Carl. Yep. Nice one to see it. Uh, Liam will now present on digital inspections for rail infrastructure. Uh, Liam's a principal research engineer at uh, the MTC in Warwick. And uh, sorry, that was my alarm for the last uh, presentation going off. And I'll uh, let you uh, get on with it. I'll just let you uh, get straight in, Liam. And uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Look forward to your presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just put the, the slides up. Let's go for the screen, nice and simple. And hopefully that's loaded for everyone. We can see that, thanks Liam. Yeah, that's perfect. Excellent. excellent, well, good afternoon everyone. I'm Liam Bradley-Smith. I'm the Principal Research Engineer for Metrology and NDT at the Manufacturing Technology Centre. And for those who don't know the, the, what the words Metrology and NDT mean, because it is more of an aerospace term, which we're, we're bringing over, it is all about collecting data, which is why I'm speaking to you guys today. And also we like to think of ourselves as the interface between the real world and the digital world. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the business and I'll tell you a bit about my team and then I'm going to finish with a few uh, interesting examples that hopefully will uh, stir a bit of conversation. So uh, the Manufacturing Technology Centre, we were opened in 2011 as a part of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. So there is a series of seven centres up and down the UK. And what the idea was back in 2011 was we will bridge, uh, bridge the gap. The valley of death is the dramatic term between ideas that are novel at university and actually getting them deployed into industry. And so that was the initial basis for the idea. Uh, we're based in Coventry, right in the Midlands, and we would work with the local founding universities, which are on the right. So that's Birmingham, Loughborough, Nottingham and TWI, which is the Welding Institute, to help mature novel new, new ideas, get them mature enough and then actually deploy them into industry. And when we first started, um, it was very much that, you know, taking PhD projects through to completion and deploying them. But we've evolved a bit since then. I'll talk about that. But we... Um, we started off mostly as aerospace and we've branched out to several different sectors and what it was all about was changing how things are done by not doing what was done before in the same sector so we started off aerospace then we pulled things into automotive and then we pulled things over to defense and we've pulled things into rail and infrastructure and the way we work now is we have a membership system um, so we've got some names you've hopefully heard of who are, are members at the MPC because they see the value in what we're doing and the future partnerships we can do with them. So we've got the likes of Highways England, HS2, Network Rail, uh, TFL, Amy. So quite a lot of names um, that you'd be aware of. And uh, as I mentioned too, so we were purely aerospace when things first began. So I was an aerospace uh, laser engineer um, before many moons ago. And what we've done over time is grow our team and our skill set. So when back in 2012, when I joined, there was only 90 staff. Well, now we're at 800 and my team in particular now has 36 people in it all sorts of different backgrounds um, ranging from these different sectors. And of course, the interesting one today is transport because we're talking a bit of rail. So our disciplines, um, we grouped ourselves in these nine big areas uh, of novel challenges and how we like to approach them. Um, we're the National Centre for Additive Manufacture, so that is building things in inorganic shapes, normally from a powder, building up non-conventional machining, things like foldable electronics, um, things like surface texturing for different properties. And I won't read them all, but we do a lot of cool things I like to think when we get to play with a lot of interesting toys. Uh, and in particular, as I say, I'm metrology and non-destructive testing. And as I say, we're the interface between the physical world and the real world. So what do we actually do uh, in metrology and NDT, M and NDT for short, I'm going to call it. Um, we're all about being independent. So as I say, we are in, in the catapult, which is actually a government funded entity. Um, we are not biased to anyone or lying to anyone. So what we're helping is the whole market of, of any application 
And what we try and do is find the best solution for that specific application. So as I say, the likes of Amy and Network Rail are end users of this process where we help them go through something, for example, like track spreading or railware, find the appropriate solution and then modify and deploy it. So we have a lot of pollination from different sectors. We, we bring across uh, and, and make it most as appropriate so it actually works in the, the new target sector. And then we optimize what's already there. So uh, we're all about accuracy. Can it be faster, cheaper, better, which is normally what a lot of people ask for. And um, we try and answer those questions and make it happen. And then adapting existing processes using information. So using the data, which obviously key to what's being talked about today is harvesting information that is normally ignored you know, quite a lot of quality and assessments are either just a visual check or a tick box on a spreadsheet. And what we're trying to do, you know, similar to the, the previous presentation that was just happening is getting that extra data and then making more informed decisions down the road about it. So we're talking about collecting your data. Um, that's, that's something in particular my team are very good at is we like to collect data and we've done quite a lot of fun examples, things like tunnel linings, walls, high rise buildings, um, I've, I've put some examples here that are most relevant to rail. So we've got um, some penetrative inspection for tunnel linings. So not just good old tap testing and a visual, but trying to inspect, you know, up to nine rings of brick deep for any voids, cracks, prosties, delaminations, etc. cetera. Um, rolling stock, so a, a live uh, inspection on the top right of a, a wheel while it's being welded to make sure it is basically, rather than having a scrapped wheel, it is being brought back to, to full life and it can be have another service. And then um, mapping out a brown site, so collecting data using various techniques, ground penetrating radar, some other fun tools. And then what's key with all of these, what we try to do is actually make it human readable. So I've got a lot of PhDs in my team. They're all very clever. As I say, our origins were the gap between university and industry. But what we've spent a lot of time over the last uh, almost 10 years is getting all that data and then converting it into human readable. So you don't have to be a PhD to understand what's going on. It is mapped out. So particularly the image on the middle right, we uh, linked up with Google Maps, so things are nicely displayed. So it's all human readable. Any defects or elements relative and asset locations are all 3D in space so that any non-skilled individual can read it quite happily. So as I say, the key for us is digitizing what's already there, understanding what you have in the real world, using that interface. And then once you've gathered it, then you can use it and then you can start making some more informed decisions. So we do a lot of digitizing for the rail world. Um, that's both rolling stock, platforms, stations, etc. Not only, you know, just collecting it as a, a point cloud for any of those who know anything about the, the scanning process, but actually digitizing it into a working model that you can use for things like simulation, asset life management estimations, um, trainings, basically anything that tech gets boots off ballast, which we're all keen for, makes it a lot safer. But then what I, the important thing for myself in, and my team is that is an accurate model. You have your, your true current state, not the design of the building you put in 50 years ago, which may just be paper or may not even exist, but this is where you currently have. So when it comes to predicting the life of the asset, you have a much more accurate timeline from there. And Am I still presenting? Apologies, I've just uh, had teams jump off. Oh, you're on mute, Carl. We seem, have lost your, we seem to have lost your presentation, Liam. I don't know why it seems to have knocked off for some reason. Let's have a look. Is that back? That's back, yeah. Excellent. Perfect. So yeah, so then the data driven maintenance, which is the clever bits. This is automatically making decisions based upon the data because of your new accurate benchmark. So this is things like the example on the top left is a high rise building. We were looking for fire safety features following the unfortunate Grenfell tragedy. Uh, can we use data to tell us if something is fire safe without the necessarily having to destructively rip it down? Um, embedding sensing into pipes or uh, assets in inspecting those uh, and surveying them remotely and also things like load bearing walls and features like that. Um, monitoring over the time by basically improving the process. So rather than having a strict schedule, you know, the, the normal routines of check it annually, whatever the case is, is putting data science behind that and making a more informed decision routine that has a more appropriate sample based either the criticality or the quality of the part. So some 
interesting examples that I unfortunately can't share too much because these are still active with single clients, but um, they're very interesting. As I say, that one of the tunnel projects we're working on now is uh, with Network Rail. Uh, and what it's all about is subsurface inspection combined with surface inspection. So using like a LIDAR and photogrammetry with ground penetrating radar on, um, well, probably going to be the cr crane sort of rail mode, RRV sort of setup. Um, but what we've done is the clever bit, as I say, is linking all the data and it gives you a TCMI report that is human readable and actually sizes and locates the defects by combining those two data sets together. And that, that's a, a run, really fun, interesting project. And then structural health monitoring and asset detection. So um, using guided wave system, so that's a, a custom collar built for that asset um, before it was put in the ground. So then it can be monitored and assessed throughout. But then in addition to that, um, using ground penetrating radar and radio wave gradiometry to inspect the brown sur surrounding area to locate assets and then monitor them all um, in a nice interface that we developed again again linking with google maps um, is the sort of things that we like to do as i say the key for us is uh digitize what's there and then make it simple to understand but uh, i went a bit fast there so you could we could catch up a bit time but uh, thank you very much and uh, any questions Sorry, thank you, Liam. I don't see where we seem to have had any questions, and uh, you've passed through everything there, but we've still you've still had your full ten minutes. So if it's okay, I'll ask if anyone has got a question for Liam. I think I'll either put it in the chat for him to answer, or if you could stay around until we get the networking at the end, Liam, and then hopefully people can pick up catch up with you then. But uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, and uh, I'm sure hopefully we'll be able to see more people us working more with the MTC going forward. Uh, if I can ask everyone, just give uh, Liam his. Uh, his round of applause please and uh congrats well done and we look forward to uh i'll move on now if that's okay Liam, to greg howell so greg if you'd like to put your uh um if you'd like to put your camera on mate. hi greg thank you very much for joining us today uh greg will now present on thermal uh, radio radiometry systems delivering uh, remote condition monitoring data to operators uh greg is a fellow of the imec -E. Uh, and former managing director of an SME supplying electromechanical products into the rail industry. Uh, and he successfully gained first of a kind funding from the DFT and led a consortium of UK companies in installing thermal radiometry systems. So Greg, uh, really looking forward to this as well. Please uh, uh, begin and thank you for joining us today. So can you see the uh, slide there, Carl? Yes, we, yes I can. Brilliant. It's not in okay. presentation mode, but we can see the slides, yeah. It is in presentation mode because I apologise for that, but I'm trying to abuse some videos within the content. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you about a first of a kind project uh, funded by the Department for Transport uh, that was looking at using thermal radiometry um, with an RCM system to enable uh, planned preventative maintenance to be instituted rather than re reactive maintenance. So. Thermal radiometry. The cameras are different to the uh, the handheld cameras that uh, people may have used in as much as every pixel on the image is assigned a measured temperature. These cameras can go up to uh, 550 degrees C uh, and they only measure surface temperatures and it is affected by emissivity. But the great feature of these cameras is that you can apply within the image 20 zones uh, within the image and apply within each zone the uh, a, an individual temperature alarm. So you can see here the clean room of an HST power car with the alternator down the bottom. The exhaust system is very hot and so those zones there have got very high temperatures associated with them, whereas the zones here, um, hot being white hot through to red, yellow then down to green and then blue, uh, these areas here have a lower temperature and so they could have a, a lower temperature assigned to them. And in terms of reducing the manual input, which is the sort of thing that uh, we've been talking about previously, uh, if a temperature in any of those zones exceeds the limit, an email is sent, which means that the operator doesn't have to worry about anything. It's just a matter of waiting. Uh, and if there's no emails, then there is no problems. So it's fitted to an HST power car. Uh, in the engine room and in the alternator room and here's a point cloud that Liam was talking about representation of the power car with our equipment cabinet mounted on the side wall. Uh, this is the installation actually in the clean room as they call it which is where the alternator is housed camera mounted on the uh, moved it 
camera mount is on the uh, top of the equipment cabinet, uh, and then there's our equipment cabinet there, and there's the alternator at the bottom. And we could take a 4K high resolution image of the alternator, the view from the camera during the installation, which is a reference image, and we don't use 4K while the train's on the go because it uses up huge amounts of data over the 4G link. We also installed one in the engine room, and this is mounted on the air intake ducting, and that's looking from the camera over the one of the bank of uh, cylinders for the engine, looking at the turbos, the outlet from the rear turbo, the turbo at the front here, then you can also see the turbos at the back. And then this is the corridor through to the alternator in the clean room. Again, the 4K reference image used taken at the installation time. And then this is the sort of image that we get from the cameras. There's the optical camera alongside the th optical sensor alongside the thermal sensor. And then we've assigned uh, zones to the cylinder head covers to the pipe from the uh, from the rear um, the rear turbocharger. We've actually got zones around the four turbochargers themselves. Uh, and then there's some leaking from the insulation around the exhaust system. So we've put zones around those. Uh, and then that we can then track as a train runs around. And as I say, if any of these zones uh, exceed the limit that's been assigned to them, then we get an email sent to us saying that there's a, uh, an incursion happened, alarm's gone off, and it includes a video clip to show which of the uh, zones has been triggered and what uh, happened during the alarm itself. So that was one strand of the project which was on board and is monitoring the uh, the prime mover and the alternator. Uh, the second project that uh, side to the project was line side version of the same system. And so this was installed next to the, uh, the, the Great Central Railway uh, in Loughborough. And here the photograph shows the installation which is completely remote. There's no mains power to this location, line side. And so we've installed a solar panel, which is charging up batteries inside this equipment cabinet. Uh, and that then is providing power to the brains for the camera. The camera's slung underneath. Uh, and inside there, there is the, it's an IP camera. So there's an ethernet switch and a router and an antenna on the top, which enables us to uh, communicate with the cameras. Uh, and then, the installation actually is on both sides of the line side. And so there's a slave camera on the far side. Uh, this is the camera you could see in the former picture. And then all that happens is that there is an Ethernet cable, fully screened Ethernet cable going through a uh, duct through the ballast, uh, connecting the two cameras. And we're providing power from this camera through power over Ethernet and the data uh, is being transmitted back to the master camera. There's also a portable setup, and you can see tripods set on the public side of network rail fence, uh, and that meant that I've been able to take the cameras out and install uh, or check on mainline operation as well. Part of the uh, the mainline operation that we've got is uh, this is a picture taken from the uh, the, the tripod mounted camera. Uh, and shows a freight train going past one of the cameras. Uh, so we've been asked to be able to look at identifying the vehicle. So in this case, it's the um, from the wagon ID. Um, and as I say, I want to abuse the, um, we also, you can see in this one, they also want us to look at the ability to look at the status of the doors, the discharge doors. In the horizontal position, these two indicators are showing that they're locked, which is good. Uh, and if they're not locked, then they're in the lower, in the vertical position. And so we're looking to do some uh, machine recognition to uh, enable that to be detected. But the one thing from the cameras is as we run through the, uh, the video, you can see that there is a witness. Hopefully you can see it on your screens. The witness of the wheel from a previous braking application, presumably uh, just residual heat within the wheel trim, uh, the wheel tread, sorry. And there's also a witness of the axle box. And that is consistent throughout the train. And you can see as that, that as we go through until we come to a vehicle here where all of a sudden uh, we have the front bogey of that vehicle. 
and the trailing bogey of that vehicle, both showing much more yellow than the previous ones, and that's indicating a hotter temperature. So the suspicion there is that um, those that vehicle may have dragging brakes associated with it. And you can also see that from this position, we can actually see the back of the opposite side of the wheel. So we're not just looking at the near wheels, uh, but we can actually see temperatures from the rear ones. Because I'm over a fence, it's not so easy, but it is better in an ordinary uh, position where we're lower down. And then similarly, the situation being proven on a passenger train. This is a HST and on the HST, you can see the temperatures of the wheels of the power car are yellow. And then as we sort of advance the video, you can see that the leading car, the brakes are all at ambient temperature. And then as is characteristic on HSTs, the coaches are typically, the other coaches are showing hotter temperatures, some red in them, and then the rear um, rear vehicles are back to yellow again. This was indicated to the operator uh, and the operator uh, during a routine overnight exam checked those brakes on that vehicle. The brakes were working but not in the initial position uh, and they replaced the distributor and uh, that confirmed that the um, indicators from the monitoring system were showing thermally that uh, the brakes were not, not working. And this means that it can be used to direct the maintenance teams because rather than having to test and examine all the brakes, all that they need to do is check for brake path thickness and then would be able to monitor the thermal uh, video to indicate whether there's any problems with any individual vehicles. And so where are we going from here? And so the next stage is um, working with RSSB and the cross industry RCM steering group to look what we can add into that uh, uh, steering group and the work they're the good work they're doing. Working with Network Rail to approve the line side system to be used uh, on their, their property. Uh, and then also the automation side. Everyone said that it's great having the data, but what we don't want to do is have to be reviewing video footage. And so the whole idea is to um, look at automating. On the onboard, it's easy because the subject does not move past the image room, so we can put those zones. When the subject's moving, that's not possible. So we're looking for some funding for this. And the idea is to compare temperatures down the train. So looking at wheel sets, are any wheel sets different to other wheel sets? indicating dragging brakes, poor performing brakes, look at axle box temperatures that are out of kilter with the others. Uh, we've also been asked to not only look at the wagon ID or the painted number as it is on a, on a passenger vehicle, but also the RFID tags, and then to be able to transmit status, so green, amber, red, to both the operator and also network rail operations. And there is a priority behind all this, because following the unfortunate derailment at Langerich, um, the RAIB recommendations have not yet been published, but it's imagined that they're going to say that we have to look at the, um, the rolling stock as it comes onto the network rail, because the primary cause of the, the uh, derailment was a break that came on during the, um, the running of the freight train that led to it derailing due to a flat on the wheels uh, going over a set of S and C crossing. So that's the situation in terms of the projects at the moment. And uh, as I say, we're looking to, uh, to work with the industry to be able to make that data available to all users. Okay. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, I'll have to cut short there, I'm afraid, make us run a bit over, but uh, if anyone's got any questions for Greg, hopefully they can uh, see at the end. Thank you very much for that. I'll uh, just give everyone, ask everyone to give you a little round of applause there. Uh, if I can immediately ask um, for Amy uh, Gooding to come up. Uh, Amy, if you're there, thank you very much for joining us today. Amy is a geotechnical engineer from SatSense, and she'll now present on the remote condition monitoring of railway assets using in their INSAR platform. Amy has experience in the geotechnical industry working as a geotechnical engineer in both the civil engineering and mining industry. She used INSAR prior to joining SatSense and is passionate about helping non-INSAR experts to get the most from the technology. So, Amy, thank you for joining us today. I'll uh, let you get straight on with your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can you see this OK? Is yeah, we can see it. It's again, it's not in presentation mode, but we can see the presentation. OK. Um, should I... is, is that it? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. OK, um, so today I'm just going to talk about how you can monitor remote uh, 
monitor railway assets remotely using INSAR. But before I just go into the presentation, I'd just like to give a quick overview of what INSAR is. So INSAR is essentially a method that uses satellites to measure how the distance to the ground changes with time. So this is just what we're going to go over today. I'm going to say who SatSense is, what does SatSense do, a bit of background into the INSTAR, the benefits and limitations of INSTAR, and then we'll apply it to a railway setting. So we'll look at Folkestone Warren and how INSTAR can help detect uh, movements across the railway line. So here's that sense. Well, we are a spin out company from the University of Leeds. And here you can see Professor Tim Wright and Professor Andy Hooper. And they both have a combined experience of four, over 40 years refining the INSAR algorithms. And they're our founders and directors. You can also see Matt here. He's our CEO and myself. We're a rapidly growing team. We now have nine employees and we're hiring too. But our main product is providing precise and up-to-date ground movement data using INSAR. And our aim of this is to make INSAR a valuable, accessible and affordable technique to a wide range of industries. INSAR has been around from the 80s, but generally it was only used in the oil and gas industry um, and it was quite expensive. Um, but now we're hoping to change that and make it accessible to the real industry, for example. And we pride ourselves on having accurate, easy to interpret, affordable and up to date data too. So keep going on about INSAR, but what exactly is INSAR? Well, INSAR is, stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, and essentially its satellites um, orbit the Earth and they measure how the distance to the ground changes with time. So if you look at this diagram on the right, what you can see here is a satellite, a cutting, your railway line and your train. And what happens is the satellite emits a beam onto the cutting surface and that hits off the cutting surface and is reflected back into the satellite and it's recorded there. And after some time, the satellite comes back over, hits the surface again and is reflected back to the satellite. But between these two acquisitions, what has happened is there's been an increase in the distance to the surface and that is recorded on the satellite. So essentially you get this insight into how the ground is behaving. You can determine if your asset is subsiding, if it's heaving or if it's got lateral movement too. So how does INSAR help asset, railway asset owners? Well, we're currently working with Network Rail and we're ensuring we're tackling the right challenges for the railway industry because we want to make it the most useful, like useful. Um, in the UK, we cover the entire network and we also do world coverage too. And we provide almost real time measurement points across the entire, entire rail network. So these are all points that have a measurement to them. And when you zoom in on them, you can see that they actually relate to the railway line here. So what you see up here and down here is white points and that indicates stability. But then you can also see these red points, which indicate settlement. And when you start clicking on these points, you can see the rate of settlement over time on this displacement time graph. And you can actually pinpoint when the settlement starts to um, stop. So between 2015 and July 2019, you've got about 80 mil of settlement. And from there onwards, it's been there hasn't been as much settlement. So what are the benefits of INSAR for asset monitoring? Well, as Steve said in the earlier talk, this is a technique that doesn't need those bits on the ballast to get a measurement. You can get four measurements every six days about sending anyone to site. You've also got data dating back to 2014 over much of the network for historical analysis too. And you can also see over the boundary fence. So you don't have to peer over the fence to see what's going on over the boundary and what um, movement is occurring there. And all this means is that you've got a bit more predictive in your maintenance and hopefully this will prevent events by identifying precursor events. But INSAR is not a perfect solution to replace all existing technology. And as in the earlier talk, it's one of those um, complementary techniques that could be used in with other techniques too. And this is because INSAR requires consistent reflections from urban objects um, on the surface too. So if you take a look at this um, picture, this diagram here on the right, you can see this railway line running in the sort of north, south and east, west direction and the towns just here. And you can see that there's good spatial density 
but when you start looking at the fields you can see that there's no points and that is one of the limitations of INSAR. Um, we're also not able to identify all failure events using INSAR because some failures don't have that precursory signals, but we're starting to do more research in that area too. So if we take a case study example, um, if we go down to the south of England, um, to Folkestone Warren, what we have down there is a large deep seeded coastal landslide. It's quite a large landslide, it's three kilometres wide by 350 metres in length. So for visual inspections, it's quite a big area to look at to try and identify what's going on there. And what you have here is the London to Dover mainline railway as well that runs through the Warren. Now, if we um, put our measurement points, the INSAR points on the map, what we see is very good spatial density, especially at the toe of the cliff, the, um, the upper cliff face and in the town of Carpel Laverne. But you see that challenge of INSAR in the fields where there's not much um, points. So you can see red points in the upper cliff and you can see blue points in the lower cliff too, um, at the toe. So if we just focus at the crest of the slope, um, we see those red points indicate negative velocities. And when you plot your time displacement um, curves, what you see is almost 65 mil of displacement from January 2015 to um, today. And then if you look at the tour of the slope, you see opposite behaviour. So you see upward movement of about 30 mil on your time displacement um, graphs, and that's showing the capabilities of INSAR being able to see how your asset is moving over from 2015 onwards. Um, so SAPSense is looking to the future and looking to give a bit more information about these points because there's a lot of data there, but we want to make the most use out of that data. So we're looking to develop um, tools that allow you to search for assets and it tells you how many assets like how many points are moving in the last year too. So in this case we're just doing a search along the line and we're looking around Doncaster. So if we click there up pops your data page and you can see Doncaster line here and you can see loads of red points. We can see we've also hoping to develop this tool with um, profile settlement as well so you can actually pinpoint exactly whereabouts um, you, you, you want to send your engineers out to site and you can also see when displacement is largest in which year. So yeah, just to conclude then, um, INSAR is a really powerful technique and it has the ability to monitor thousands of assets from space. It's not a perfect solution to replace all existing technology, but it's definitely a complementary technology it has the potential to save on monitoring costs and these are just some of the countries that we cater for and if you'd like to hear any more um i'm please contact me on amy.gooding at satsense thank you very much for your time um any questions Sorry, Amy. Yeah, thank you very much for that. We've got a couple of questions, but might only have time for one, but there's two that are very similar, uh, asking what the level of um, accuracy uh, is this is, uh, particularly if uh, within regards to vegetation uh, on the ground and if that affects the ability to spot movement or if you can spot vegetation. Uh, I don't know if you can give us a view on that. Yeah, so vegetation is definitely like one of the issues with INSAR. It's, it's quite a challenge. Um, if you have like loads of data points around the vegetation, we could probably get to around five five mil accuracy. Um, but we are developing addition, looking at those rural points and trying to increase the accuracy too. But across more urban areas, we can get to one mil accuracy. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Amy. There are a number of other questions, but we are running a bit short on time and, you've, uh, and you're quite close. So if it's okay, if I could actually just have a look at them in the chat and maybe catch up with people. Uh, at the thing but thank you very much again another very excellent presentation if i can ask everyone to give uh, amy a very well deserved round of applause there thank you very much thank and you. if i can immediately ask uh, keith wilson and jackie butterfield to come up apologies for the slight delay keith and jackie uh, but uh, keith and jackie are from uh, lb foster europe uh, with keith being the business development manager there and jackie is the lead applications engineer uh, Keith is a business development manager and has worked in the real industry for 25 years with broad experience of working with customers to provide remote condition monitoring solutions 
Uh, Jackie is a lead applications engineer and specializes in friction management technologies for both trackside and onboard application, uh, working with customers to develop and implement uh, friction management solutions. So uh, if I can just ask you to bring your presentation on and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Look forward to seeing this as well. OK, thank you. I'll um, I'll kick off. Uh, I think we've got 10 minutes between us, so I'll, I'll try and go fairly quickly. So uh, if Jackie, you can move on to the, the first slide, that'll be great. OK, brilliant. Um, well, we've seen a, a number of different um, methods already of collecting data from a, a number of uh, railway assets. And it was interesting to hear Tim and Steve earlier talking about the potential growth of uh, assets to be monitored um, and I think we'd back that up at LB Foster. Uh, we seem to get involved in all sorts of weird and wonderful pilot schemes and trials uh, to monitor different assets all the time and one of the tasks that we have is that each asset type monitored uh, provides specific recorded data that we along with what uh, Network Rail was saying earlier we have to translate into that useful information for the end user. Now we all know that more data supports the decision making process uh, regarding not only improved safety and reducing boots on ballast, uh, but also we've got some um, preventive measures to give advance warning that helps to reduce train delays and also in optimizing asset maintenance and moving to um, the predict and prevent regime that uh, I know we've all been working towards for many, many years now. I guess the problem that we, we've come across is that even within our own systems, the volume of data from supplier systems is enormous. And for a network operator um, like Network Rail, when we've got a number of different suppliers with their own systems, the amount of data that they must take on board um, is at a point where it, it's almost too much to handle, all through different web portals. So what we've tried to do with our own in-house software team is to try and develop our software with the customer in mind. And we know that the data has to be presented in an intuitive and a user-friendly interface. And I know others have touched on that already today, um, but filtering out the false alarms to ensure that only the real alarms are sent is a massive part of it. And a lot of that is tailor-made to each application to make sure that the alarms go to the nominated individuals to have the maximum effect that we want. We've incorporated a number of things into our own software system. Uh, the, the RAG status most of you will be familiar with, red, amber, green, so it gives a, an easy visual display. Um, graphical displays, full asset history, drill down menus, they all help. But what we found, uh, bearing in mind that we're, we're a global company and we've got a number of systems embedded in, in um, United States, Canada, Mexico and mainland Europe as well, is that we found the best way forward is to develop any system in partnership with the customer. Um, and I think most suppliers would agree that if you can get the customer on board early, particularly with development projects, uh, it saves an awful lot of time um, at the end of the project trying to put things right that uh, maybe were misunderstood along the way. Certainly in the UK um, and dealing with network rail, uh, we know that uh, all monitoring systems have to be designed to be compliant uh, in the future to be um, compliant with network rail's intelligent infrastructure system. Um, I think we heard already earlier this afternoon that we're not quite sure how we're going to do that and, and where the APIs will come from. So I guess again, it's up to the suppliers um, to work very closely with Network Rail and other operators um, to make sure that we get that right between us because I've been involved with remote condition monitoring now for, for many, many years um, with a couple of different companies and uh, I don't think things have moved on quite as quickly as everyone would have liked. Um, I mentioned already the anatomy software and Jackie will demonstrate that a little bit later, um, but just internally for our own applications, we've tried to standardize the front end and the data formats for all our own systems and make sure that they're future proof uh, to integrate with others going forward. So if you can put the next one up, Jackie. Um, this is just a demonstration of one of the systems that we've got primarily in, in uh, the Americas but it also takes on board the maintenance aspect of the actual sensors we're using. Uh, this is for a flood monitoring system, and it's just a diagram rather than show you the, the full spec of what we've done. Um, but 
we've been fairly clever in developing the flood poles themselves in as much as existing flood poles have always had the problem of after a flood, they're generally full of debris and silt uh, and the moving parts in there then need to be taken away and overhauled and cleaned. Um, so we've come up with a, a reduced maintenance version where we use capacitive sensing technology. And as soon as the water level is detected, it uses, it triggers the alarm by a GPRS to a base station. And that also alerts a camera, which then switches on. So you can use a solar powered CCTV system to actually verify the flood through photographs or video. All of the components used have been designed to be ultra low power. Uh, so we're able to use solar power and rechargeable batteries. And so the beauty of that is that you can put these in places uh, where power isn't available in very remote locations. And we know that Network Rail have already identified over 200 um, potential flood risk locations. Um, and being able to get stuff out there using solar power um, is a great advantage. Um, and again, we use our own anatomy software with the user friendly front end. And with every single installation, we have to customize the alarm levels for the height of the water, when you want the camera to click in. Um, and we just use standard um, 3G comms so that there's nothing particularly clever. As long as there's comms there, we can put a system in that will monitor not only flood, but a number of other things as well. And just before I hand over to Jackie, if we just go on to the next slide, I will just uh, go through some of the weird and wonderful things that we're involved in at the moment. Um, and we tend to be, for, for those of us old enough to remember the programme, the A-Team, we tend to be the people that come in uh, when people have a problem uh, that nobody else can solve. We use an awful lot of low power solutions uh, to utilise things like solar and wind power as well for remote locations. But where there is power, uh, we've used LIDAR, which I know was mentioned earlier in the day, um, for monitoring level crossings. We do a lot of work for monitoring earthworks and rockfall as well. The beauty of LIDAR being that it will detect the exact size and location of anything that falls onto the track. We use a range of accelerometers on tilt tag te <coughs> excuse me, technology for monitoring landslips and avalanches. Now we're looking at some uh, potential opportunities in Scandinavia. I mentioned the flood monitoring already using capacitive sensors. Uh, we're looking at using the same technology that you have in airbags in your car, uh, piezoelectric sensors for the monitoring of bridge strikes, and also looking at simple contact sensors for monitoring access gates. And again, CCTV can be used independently for monitoring level crossings, track conditions, or also for verifying uh, other asset uh, problems, uh, bridge strikes being one, floods being another, and also site access. Um, and I'll now hand you over to Jackie, who'll talk a bit more detail about friction management systems we have and the anatomy software demonstration. Thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. You've left me two minutes to do it, so it's going to be a very, very, it's going to be a very whistle stop tour. Um, just quickly, in terms of the friction management, we're talking here about trackside um, friction systems, so gauge face lubrication, top of rail friction modifiers, or traction gel applicators. Um, so the, the the remote performance monitoring system is embedded into the the cabinets themselves. Um, in and in units that are already in the fields, you can easily retrofit this as well. So the, the sensor, the operational data get, gets transmitted through the mobile phone network, as Keith said, and then uh, is, is processed and then goes into the, the web interface. But also we're developing solutions where it can be directly integrated into the customer interface. So if you just bear with me, I'll just swap over onto the portal. Um, can I just ask that you could, can you see that? Yeah, you can see the portal. Yeah, that's Thank fine. You. Yeah. Um, so the, the portal's configured um, for unique access for users and that user access is tailored to 
um, the, the individual user, depending on who they are, who they work for. Um, so you can set up various permission and viewing levels. Um, the home page can be configured for, for different dashboards. So I've got several dashboards here uh, for, for various clients. Um, and the dashboard will tell you uh, just a quick sna snapshot of how many systems you have in the field, what they are, whether they're gauge face or top of rail, etc. Uh, a snapshot of the unit status. Uh, so here's the, the, the traffic light system for the alarm status. And then you can actually have a look at the, where the units are in the field or just a list view. So if I click on the map view here, uh, this is the uh, Wessex outer region. So you can zoom in, you can manipulate the map uh, and then you can look at the units, click on and just view the details going into that particular unit. So each unit has, a, again, a dashboard with a, a snapshot status of the, the red, amber, green um, for, for the different sensor readings and operational readings, uh, including product level, the power supply, the battery temperature. There's alarms on the electrical cabinet door and the product door, um, as well as other, set, uh, other readings like uh, amperes, uh, train passes, um, and also the settings on the unit. So you've got information on the, the last train that passed, the duration, the number of wheels that passed, the voltage and the current for that pass, and how many pump cycles were activated on the unit. And then further down, you've got your details of the unit, who it belongs to, where it is, what it is, a uh, unique identifier for the asset, um, whether it's a single or a dual track unit, how it's powered. In this case, it's a, a DC solar unit. Then you've got location details. And again, you can click on and view on the map. And then you've got your settings that's actually controlling the unit. So in terms of interrogating the data, each of these status you can look at graphically. So just click on the button and you can either uh, view the last 30, 60 or 90 days, or you can put in your own specified date range. Um, not only can you just hover over, you can see in, uh, independent readings for, for each uh, time period, but you can also add on to the, uh, the graph. You can add on other variables. So I can put on here total wheels. So this will then plot the total wheel count against the product level. Uh, so you can have multiple variables on the same graph. You can then just click on and download it as a, either an image or you can actually download the data to a, a comma delimited file so you can interrogate the data in, in Excel. So um, I haven't got time to look at the, the full functionality. I'm two, nearly three minutes over now. Yeah. But there's but there's reports, um, so yeah. you can configure reports, you can have emails reported to you, you can have alarms reported to you. Um, so it, it's a very kind of intuitive system that yeah. uh, you can monitor. And as look at, looking back at the, in terms of predicting, you can um, look at the product level. Uh, obviously the product level is calibrated to the tank. So if you've got uh, a 90 litre tank and you've got 50%, you know you've got 45 litres left and you can then work out your maintenance schedules around that. Yeah. Okay. So that is yeah. all I've got time for. Yes. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks very much. I mean, maybe if anyone would like to hear get a more detailed description from Jackie, they can do. But if I could just ask everyone to give a, a, a round of applause and I just want to get straight into these two elevator pitches who have been waiting very, very patiently uh, today, all day. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Keith. I'm sorry we are running a bit late. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate you trying to run through that as quickly as you can. Um, Bradley Sparks, if you'd like to come up, uh, I'd like to give, uh, there's two elevator pitches now. We have one from uh, Bradley Sparks and one from Swami Nagarajan. If Bradley, if you'd like to come up first, um, are you still here? Are you here, Bradley? Yes, you are. Uh, Bradley, yes. thank Hi. you. Hi, Bradley, thank you. Um, there's no time for questions after these, but our two pitches will be joined for, after the informal network session, which we'll have about 15 minutes of. So, Bradley, uh, you're with the UAV and 
pilot sensor operator for Bridgeway Consulting. If you'd like to take it away, please do. Aware I've only got five minutes, so it might have to be um, a bit like the elevator out of the uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, so uh, yeah, just a quick intro to myself. Um, so uh, I'm Bradley Sparks, and I'm the Chief UAV Pilot at Bridgeway Aerial. Um, so today I'm delighted to be able to speak to you about how we use drones or UAVs to capture data of the rail environment, um, but also keeping boots off ballast. So just a quick overview of the company. Um, we have been around since 2010. We were recently acquired in 2017 by Bridgeway Consulting, um, so we're part of the Bridgeway Consulting family. Uh, but since 2015, we've been part of the Network Rail UAV framework, and we're one of the first four operators on that framework. And we've actually been instrumental in, uh, since then in spearheading the use of drones around the UAV and uh, around the rail industry. Um, so innovators in kind of using the latest platforms and payloads over rail. So for things from high res uh, cameras to multispectral cameras, uh, thermal LIDAR units as well, uh, more recently. We also have an exemption from the Civil Aviation Authority um, to fly in places like, like London. So typically you wouldn't be able to fly as close to people, but we're able to kind of do that thanks to that exemption and work on projects such as HS2. Um, so the kind of main reason we work in rail is to solve some of the issues around access. So we're aware of the headache of possessions and line blocks, how these can take several weeks um, to actually get sorted. And even when you do, do then get access to a track environment, sometimes you're limited to working at night, and that's not always the most conducive to getting the best examination data. Um, so that's one of the benefits of using drones. You can do it in the day um, with the, the line open effectively. They're also less intrusive and more agile. Uh, there are obviously also kind of uh, constraints around safety, and obviously um, that's a, a hot topic at the moment. So. By keeping the uh, UAV operator in an off-track position, we can massively improve safety as well. Um, as well as that, we've also encountered some interesting use cases for drones recently. So, for example, we've been asked um, to survey a number of state uh, stations. So, we've had instances where uh, platforms are actually effectively hollow and they can't main, can't carry the weight of a mute or a, a cherry picker. So, in that case, we've been able to actually send up drones into the roof of that station. Uh, so, that's an interesting use case. And obviously, just in general, drones offer a different perspective um, to what you would normally be able to get from a kind of terrestrial position. The data as well, um, it, being able to capture a lot of data in a short space of time and then also have multiple people be able to look at that data um, on, a, on, a, on a computer together and get a second opinion um, is, is really valuable. It's obviously repeatable as well, that type of data collection. So we can go back and you can do comparisons very easily. So just to give you a quick overview of the kind of data we can capture with a drone, um, if you look at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see kind of a large scale um, inspection of a retaining wall. This is a retaining wall in kind of a maritime type environment, near rail infrastructure as well. Um, and if you look at the red box above that, you can see that we can zoom into that scale of a, of a survey and look at things like cracks in masonry. Uh, so that's the level of detail we can kind of capture from a UAV from an off track position. Scaling that up, we can also use the same type of data collection to create 3D models. So in this instance, there's uh, an example of a model of York Station. Um, you can zoom into that and get a similar level of detail. You can see all sorts of stuff across that site, uh, off track and on track. Um, you can also leverage that data to create um, as-built CAD drawings um, to derive volumetric measurements. So for stuff like stockpiles. Um, there are so many different uses and it's a, it's worth noting that at this stage of time we're in the position where drones are getting and their, their payloads are getting so good that you can effectively fly, fly 50 meters above the rail and zoom in on an individual bolt and read serial codes um, from from that that camera view so it's, it's a very um, interesting and uh, useful technology it's obviously not the panacea for everything but um it's very useful um so more recently, we've actually been one of the first companies to invest in a UAV LiDAR unit um, in the rail industry, and that's something we're really excited about. And with that, we can kind of better penetrate vegetation, so we can look at uh, topographic measurements, both for inter an internal use um, and for kind of external clients. We've used that within Bridgeway to um, inform our own site investigation works. So for example, uh, drilling boreholes around tunnels and like the kind of depths that we're, we're working with. We can also capture general kind of photography for project progress, um, the PR, for kind of 
informing the public how their you know, investment is, is coming on. Uh, and also thermal imagery as well. Here's a solar example, but we've also used that around the rail environment. So I'll just quickly wrap up with a slide on the future. Um, the government is really pushing kind of drone technology and unmanned technology, um, particularly in the area of beyond visual line of sight um, capability. So this is something with the Civil Aviation Authority. So at the moment, we're kind of limited in flying 500 metres from the pilot um, and keeping that drone in view of the pilots at all times. But the way the kind of capability is moving at the moment is towards being able to actually fly ten, many tens of miles of, of track um, away from the pilot without that drone being visible to the pilot. Um, and that's really exciting. And this is obviously kind of um, aided by the uh, kind of the increased endurance of these platforms. So the battery um, battery technology is improving all the time. So we're kind of seeing flight times near an hour for these multi-role uh, rotor craft. Um, and the sensor resolution and accuracy is improving as well. And I'll just wrap up by finishing on the automation, uh, something we've got a keen eye on as well. That's going to obviously revolutionise things. Thank you very much, Bradley. That's much appreciated. Uh, if I could just ask uh, Swami to come up, if I can ask everyone to give uh, Bradley his uh, round of applause and Swami if you would like to come and join us. Uh, um, thank you for Swami, Swami Nagarathan to, for joining us. Um, you are our final pitch for, the, pitch for the day. He's the customer safe strategy executive for Omnicon Balfabity and I'll just hand over to you now Swami. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah thanks Carl. Uh, I hope you guys can see me on the screen is coming through. I'll, I'll try to make up for some of the loss. Yeah brilliant. So I'll um, try to make up for some of the lost time. I know it's almost five o'clock. So hi everyone, my name is Swami Nagarajan. Um, I work with Omnicom Balfa BT and today I'll take you guys through some of the exciting work that Omnicom has been doing uh, with our partners in the remote condition monitoring space uh, driven by the data acquisition. Uh, so Omnicom Balfa BT, who are we? Uh, we are a team of 100 plus electromechanical engineers and software developers surrounded by uh, project management experts from Balfour BT and commercial and admin business staff. Uh, we are based out of our offices in Derby and York, and we support uh, all phases of product lifecycle with asset owners uh, and OEMs. So a brief overview of the market segments in which Omnicom Balfour BT operates and what we do really. Uh, one of the overarching principles that we apply to everything we do is of bringing infrastructure into the office environment, into the desktop environment, and that's what we have been doing over the past 20 years in UK and abroad. So a quick overview of the segments we operate in. Survey and measurement, uh, I think a lot of you might already be familiar with OmniCapture 3D and OmniSurveyor 3D, surveying technologies that Omnicom pioneered over the last two decades, uh, which is massive, uh, massively useful for major resignaling scheme, overhead line schemes, and so on and so forth. Uh, we power the technology behind the scenes on uh, automated track inspection on PLPRs and the yellow measurement fleets of NMTs, uh, which takes boots of ballast, of course, uh, and currently in fashion with the red zone working uh, requirements mandated by the ORR uh, for next summer 2022. Um, we are in the track geometry domain with our flagship product true track 2 and uh, we have been providing overhead line monitoring capabilities uh, to various asset owners across the globe um, in structure gauging domain we have been one of the pioneers uh, with our software such as clear route and we currently support structure gauging train in various capacities and the national gauging database uh, i'm going to just finish with this guiding principle that we always apply to everything we do, supporting our customers to realize and optimize the power of data. We have been working with various asset owners across the world, especially Network Rail, who is one of our biggest partners and who have trusted us over the last two decades, and various OEM in terms of in-service monitoring, Bombardiers, Alstom's, Hitachi, and we do a lot of work uh, around the globe with SMRTs and Hong Kong MTR. So I'll quickly give you guys an overview of our asset view uh, database, which is a graphical interface of our level crossing health monitoring system, which helps network rail maintenance engineers immediately know the health of various components, electromechanical components of level crossing across the network. So here looking at, so due to the constraints of time, I won't be able to take you guys through the full software capabilities, but 
if anyone is interested, just feel free to give me a shout at the end of this and I can arrange a demo for you guys. Uh, yeah, just at the dashboard, any of the network rail maintenance engineer can get a real time uh, view of the health of any of the level crossing components by just clicking on the place marks and uh, red and green obvious you know visual indicators and they can drill down onto various timings of various uh, mechanical components and electrical components we monitor the health of the asset with various cts inclinometers and various other types of sensors that we have developed over the years uh, the benefits that such a system uh, omni lx which is our flagship a system for level crossing monitoring for network rail. Uh, the benefits that such a system has been delivering to network rail is reducing the need for attending testing and monitoring, uh, essentially taking boots of ballast. Uh, it provides real time continuous monitoring to network rail maintenance engineers at the touch of a finger from the safety of a desktop. Uh, it removes the need for quarterly tests and reduces the scope of annual tests, which is main, uh, which is mandated by Network Rail SMS standards, uh, the Signal Maintenance Specification standards. Uh, I'm happy to go through it in some more detail for whoever is interested uh, after the Q&A session. Uh, and it reduces the component testing requirements for Network Rail maintenance engineers, uh, including LC11s and LC21s, which is your um, audiovisual. Uh, tests and LC21, your BR843 barrier test. Um, and most importantly, it reduces for the passenger's sake, it reduces the level crossing failure rate, uh, keeps the passenger journey on time and uh, off the road users as well. Everybody knows of you know how much delay it causes to the network with just one level crossing out of service and for the road passengers as well. Overall, increases the safety and reliability of the network and the road users and commuters and reduces the cost and helps network rail maintenance engineers to optimize their resources for more pressing tasks on the network. Uh, as I said, anything you guys want to know more about what Omnicom does uh, in UK and across the world, give us a shout on omnicom at balfabt.com or my mobile number and I'm happy to stay back for questions. Thank you very, thank you very much, Swami. Uh, excellent way to round off the event and if uh, everyone could just give their, your well-earned virtual applause. Uh, I want to apologise for the bit of the overrun, but I think we all agree that there were some very excellent presentations there with a lot of very, very good content. Uh, so can I just thank all of our speakers and if we can just give another virtual round of applause for all the speakers who've joined us this afternoon. Thank you very much for your time and uh, absolutely excellent presentations.